Welcome all to the Health and Wellbeing Board partners to this virtual meeting of the BCP Health and Wellbeing Board and to the press and members of the public who are viewing the live stream of the meeting. Uh, may I take this opportunity to welcome all the new members to this meeting of the board, uh, in addition to Sean Thomas, Education Representative, Richard Jenkins, Mafid Nyman and Simon Watkins uh, representing the CCG, and also wel welcome uh, Jenny Douglas Todd who is attending the meeting as an observer. Uh, I will now ask the Democratic Services Officer to set out the housekeeping arrangements uh, for the meeting. and will be published on the Council's website for a minimum of six months. In order to ensure the meeting is managed effectively, please could everyone follow these ground rules for speaking. Only speak when invited to by the Chairman. Always turn on your video function when invited to speak. Please state your name before you speak if you've not been introduced by name. Some people may need to dial into the meeting and therefore will not have the benefit of the vigil. Mute your microphone when you are not talking. If you would like to speak on an item, please do so by utilising the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the Teams window. As a reminder, don't forget to lower your hand once you finish speaking. Um, there is access to the messaging bar, but if I can just ask members that this should not be used unless you are raising a point of order or providing the wording for a motion. Please remember that the panel is visible to all and subject to public information requests. If there are any recommendations moved that require a formal vote by the board, this will be carried out by the chairman, asking for a response of for, against or abstain from each member of the board. If for any reason the chairman's connection is lost during the meeting, the vice chairman will take the chair until the connection resumes. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to a silent for duration of the meeting. And Chairman, before I hand back to you, can I take the opportunity of apologising for an error on the agenda whereby um, the organisation that Karen Loftus um, represents as Chief Executive is the Community Action Network BCP and not as detailed on the agenda. So obviously for future records, we will ensure that that is updated. I will now hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we do have some apologies for this morning's meeting. So we have uh, apologies from Graham Farrant, James Vaughan and Eugenia Fell. Uh, I will we'll go around now and introduce everybody because uh, I know we have some new members and for the benefit of uh, anyone that is uh, watching this via the live stream. Um, if you are a substitute, if you, if you could say uh, if any, who you are substitute for, I think that would be helpful as well. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know myself, I'm Tim Goodson. I'm the Chief Officer of uh, Dorset CCG. Uh, I'll now go down uh, effectively the list. I, I will do the presenters first uh, because they, they appear on the, the order first. And if I could just ask you to say your name and uh, title of which organisation you're from. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Chris uh, Harold. Chairman, just to clarify, um, Chris Harrod is doing, it's Karen Tompkins here, Chris Harrod is doing the live stream. Um, so okay. during the meeting, he's unable to comment. So he is one of our Democratic Services Officers. Thank you. OK, good to have you on board, Chris. Uh, Jan Thurgood. Thank you, Tim. I'm Jan Thurgood. I'm the Corporate Director for Adult Social Care for BCP Council. Uh, Karen Tins, we've all met already, but I'll let Karen just introduce herself again. Thank you, Tim. Karen Tompkins, um, Deputy Head of Democratic Services. Uh, Max Reed. Uh, Max Reed, Democratic Services. Be probably got a tech support in the background. Morning, Max. Or afternoon, even. Uh, Richard Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Richard Jones, Head of Democratic Services, BCP Council. 
Uh, Mark Callahan. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mark Callahan, and Assistant Chief Constable with Dorset Police, representing um, Chief Constable James Vaughan. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, Kat McMillan. Good afternoon, Kat McMillan, Head of Community Engagement at BCP Council, substitute for Kate Ryan until she can attend. Thank you. Hi, uh, Councillor. Good afternoon, Councillor Bobby Dove, um, Cabinet Lead Member for Equality. Uh, Councillor Mike White. Yeah, Councillor Mike White. I'm the uh, BCP portfolio holder for children and young people. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Nicola, Nicola Green. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, as Tim said, Nicola Green. I'm the Cabinet Member at BCP Council for COVID Resilience, Public Health and Education. Uh, Jenny Douglas Todd, who's observing today. Hello, Jenny Douglas Todd, Independent Chair for the Dorset Integrated Care System and observing today. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Redding. Good afternoon, Elaine Redding, Corporate Director of Children and Young People, BCP Council. Uh, Debbie Fleming. Hello there, Debbie Fleming, Chief Executive for University Hospitals Dorset, uh, incorporating uh, Bournemouth Hospital, Christchurch Hospital and Poole Hospital. Uh, Catherine Harvey. Yes, Kate Harvey, Dorset Healthcare, representing Eugenia Fellow. Uh, Karen Loftus. Hello, Karen Loftus, Chief Community Action Network, local infrastructure charity for Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole. Uh, Louise Bates. Hi, I'm Louise. I'm the manager of Healthwatch Dorset, the local independent organisation representing people's views on health and care. Afternoon, uh, Mafid Nyman. Hi, it's Mafid, I'm Dorset CCG Chair. Uh, Paul Eagledon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm one of the public health consultants in Public Health Dorset. Afternoon, uh, Richard Jenkinson. Hello, I'm Richard Jenkins and I'm a GP in Christchurch and Christchurch Primary Care Network uh, Clinical Director. Uh, Richard, uh, Sam Crow. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Crow, Director of Public Health for Dorset. And... Good Sam, uh, Sally Sancroft. Afternoon, everybody. Sally Sancroft. I'm Director of Primary and Community Care in the CCG Clinical Commission Group. Very festive. Uh, Seth Y. Good afternoon, everyone. Seth Y, Area Manager for Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service. Seth. Uh, Sean Thomas. Uh, Sean Thomas, CEO of Ambitions Academy Trust. We've got 11 schools in BCP, which span from special schools through primary and secondary, representing education. Afternoon, Sean. And last but not least, uh, Simon Watkins. I am GP in Poole and representing the CCG. Okay, it's me. Oh, there you go. Dice, Karen. Oh, my apologies. Uh, uh, Councillor Karen Rampton. Thank you, Tim. I'm uh, Councillor Karen Rampton and I'm the portfolio holder for adult health and social care at BCP. So, hopefully, that, that's everyone. Uh, so, so we'll move on now to agenda item three, which is the election of chairman. Uh, I'm going to ask the, the board now for any nominations for the role of chair uh, and request that you indicate by raising your hand if there are more than two members of the board nominated, a secret ballot will be conducted. Uh, Councillor Karen Rampton. I'd like to nominate Councillor Nicola Green. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to second that nomination. Do we have any further nominations? No, OK, I think we'll, we'll take that as um, supported then. Uh, and that just leaves myself to hand over to the, uh, the new chairman of the board. 
Tim, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad you've done all the tricky bits and I shall endeavour to uh, try and keep the uh, the technology um, working. Um, we will uh, now move on. Um, so just before I do, there are a couple of things that I would just like to say in um, noting that there are four new elected members to this board as well as some substitutes today. Um, it's um, probably worth noting that there was a change of administration um, uh, back at the end of October, um, and that explains the uh, the change in the elected members who have joined the board. But I would like, if I can, in an opening remark, to thank the um, the members of the previous administration who went before us and set this board up, and I'm sure have formed some very effective partnerships. And I know that they were very um, determined in their efforts to move on uh, this agenda. So um, I will very shortly move to um, item four, but just one note for everybody that due to the attendance of um, uh, Kate Ryan, she's, um, we've been notified that she will be delayed. Um, so we may well swap items eight and nine around with everybody's permission, but we'll keep an eye on, on Kate's attendance for that. Um, Karen, I wonder if I could hand back to you, please, for um, items four and five. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, item four, can I ask members of the board to make any specific declarations of interest in respect of what you have before you this afternoon? Councillor Bobby Dove. Yes, thank you. Just I know that send is on the um, agenda at some point and I have a family member who has an EHCP with the council. Thank you. Are there other declarations to make? Thank you very much. Moving on to item five, which is public issues. Um, Chairman, I can report that we don't have any public issues for this meeting um, this afternoon. So that takes you to the next item on the agenda. Thank you, Karen. Um, we have um, so item six, um, a requirement to confirm the minutes of the last meeting. They have been circulated, um, but I wasn't there. I would normally be the chair who would move those um, uh, those minutes, but since I wasn't at the meeting, Tim, I wonder if you could kindly move them if you are content that they're a, um, an accurate record of that meeting. Uh, yes, I was, I was very happy with the minutes, so there's, there's no additional comments from me on them. Thank you very much. If um, everyone is agreed, um, Bobby, I can see your hand is up. Is it on the minutes? Uh, yes, it is. I wasn't at the last meeting, but I noticed that on the bottom of page eight there is an error in the uh, spelling of the independent observer thank you very much for that if we can correct a spelling mistake are we happy uh, to accept the minutes as a true accurate reflection that's brilliant thank you um, we'll then move on to item seven which is the health and wellbeing uh, board business protocol members membership and terms of uh, reference karen is this another one for you it's uh, it seems a it, it does what it says on the tin type of paper. It, it does. Thank you, Chairman. Um, th this was some of the members of the board will be aware that this was discussed at the last meeting. But as you've indicated, due to the change of administration, um, we have amendments that are set out um, in the documents, changing the membership and reflecting the appropriate cabinet members and cabinet lead member. Um, and in addition, if I can highlight, um, we have new members of the CCG. Um, Mr. Watkins, Mr. Jenkinson um, and Mr. Niman, um, and that's already been reflected in the board membership. And we have a new member, um, which is our education representative, which is Sean Thomas. So it was an opportunity to bring it back to the board for the board to accept those changes in membership so that we can then update our, our membership protocol. But indeed, if the board have any further comments that they want to make on any other elements of the documents, I'll, I'll try and respond to questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. Um, I would like to extend uh, a welcome to those members from the CCG and um, from education um, to this board. I know you have very busy daily lives anyway, um, but your input into this meeting and, um, and, and the agenda is very, very welcome. So our sincere thanks to you. Are there any questions or comments around that? It's always quite difficult chairing a Teams meeting because you can't catch anyone's eye. Um, so I will pause, um, but also we don't want to be um, uh, spending a lot of time. So 
put your hand up quick. Um, otherwise, we'll move on, Sally. Thank you. Sorry, I just noticed on the bottom of page 25, I think um, Karen Loftus, the, the name is is not quite right as you reflected on the last minutes for the infrastructure. It should be can, shouldn't it, I think? Talks about Paul, Bournemouth and Paul Voluntary Services Councils. Yes. Yeah, yeah j j just to clarify, I will make sure that that's rectified to ensure that it's the appropriate organisation. So happy to update that. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we will then move on to item nine. I think since we um, we will revert to that um, item nine before item eight, um, which is the local outbreak management plan. And Sam Crow from uh, the Dorset Director of Public Health, you're going to speak to this. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I've just realised I made a bit of an error in that I haven't forwarded my slides to Democratic Services. I was um, hoping to show a couple of slides today, so if you bear with me, perhaps I'll forward those to Karen right now, and I'm hoping that Karen will be able to bring them up and present for me. So bear with me a second. More than happy um, to see that, Sam. Thanks very much, Karen. So they're just coming on their way to now. <coughs> Just while I'm doing that, I was just reflecting back on the, the minutes and the, the meeting back in September, and I'll pick out a, a key phrase from those minutes when we presented on the communications plan in connection to the local outbreak management plan. And uh, I think at the time we were noting that we were starting to see an upturn in cases and an increasing number of incidents that were starting to uh, reach the public health team and, and colleagues. and um, as we sort of come back into the board after, I guess, three months on, that was certainly true. And I'll, I'll take you through how the last two or three months have felt. So those are on the way to you via email now, Karen. So hopefully you'll have them in a minute. OK, um, bear with me. No problem. So just while those are being brought up, by Karen, I'll just run through roughly what I'd like to cover today. I think it'd be helpful to start with a bit of an update on our local position. So I'll go through our local case rates and I'll show I'll show you what's been happening in terms of the epidemiology affecting the area. Uh, certainly the way that the cases have risen and also dropped dramatically in the past few weeks uh, as we've gone through this second wave. And I thought we'd spend some time talking about the current control measures. Obviously, we've exited from the second lockdown on the 2nd of December and I'll talk a little bit about the current arrangements under tier two. Um, then to bring it back to the local outbreak management plan, I'll give the board a flavour of how the public health team and partners have been working across the system to cope with the second wave and touch a little bit on the role of the local outbreak engagement board, which has been meeting to agree some of the cons. We'll look at some of the communications messages and then I'll provide a bit of a forward look for how we see the next few months panning out. And as if by magic, um, there are the slides. Thanks ever so much, Karen. So if I could have uh, slide two, please, that would be great. Can, sorry, can everybody see those just before? I think we... they've just disappeared. They were up and Let's they've gone Let's try again. Gone. They're and now they're not. not unfortunately not letting me share at the moment um bear with me what i can do is forward to a colleague um, that's okay i've been given i've been given presenter right so it looks as if i can do it direct from okay. my apologies there we go. from here sam excellent you can all see them yeah so many many thanks to whoever sorted that out that's perfect um so current position um Fair to say lockdown two has had the desired effect. So we've had a, a dramatic fall in cases, 45% fall in total in the seven day infection rate over the past 14 days. So the current rate is at 84 cases per 100,000 population. Um, if you remember sort of three or four weeks ago, we were reaching 250 cases per 100,000. So been a significant fall, which is, which is great. But I think even more significant, I'm really pleased to see the infection rates falling in the over 60s. So the most recent figure that I have for the seven day period is that the, those infections are now down to 68 cases 
per 100,000. And again, two or three weeks ago, they were um, significantly higher, around about 150 cases per 100,000. And that's a key measure that government looks at to see and assess where uh, council areas should be in terms of local control. So good to see that coming down and hopefully that reflects the improved position in our health and care system as well. In terms of testing, um, we're still testing around 9,500 people across BCP Council per week through Pillar 2, but the positivity has really dropped. antigen tests which is which is good news just to touch on the epidemic curve which i mentioned in the opening comments i think this uh, speaks volumes really probably more than words so you can just see just how dramatic the increase was uh, throughout september and early october and this is what we were really concerned about um, occasionally it showed signs of stabilizing but then it would step up again and you can sort of associate various events with the, the steps up. The first one was the return of people from holiday and the opening up of schools. The second uh, ramping up was the return of students. Um, and that really fueled uh, an increase in our infection rates, not just in the student population, but the wider 16 to 29 year old groups. And that continued to drive transmission locally, uh, including increasing infection rates in the older age groups. But you can see the effectiveness of reducing social mixing, uh, a very, very dramatic fall off in our case rates, which is welcome to see. So the current control measures, just a few notes on this, obviously lockdown's over. Both unitary councils are now under tier two restrictions. And the, the big impact of that is this restriction on social mixing between households indoors. So although um, the economy has started to open up under two, tier two restrictions. You cannot mix with other households in indoor settings, including in bars and restaurants. The tiers are going to be reviewed on the 16th of December. Um, but one issue that's been causing some confusion 
is that that doesn't mean the rules around the tier system are reviewed. It just means that local areas will be reassessed in terms of how far infection rates have hopefully fallen. And if we're making good progress, then we can put forward uh, hopefully a strong case to, to, to re-examine those control measures and make sure that they're appropriate. Um, I think the tier system, what I've picked up, is fixed until a review in Parliament in February 2021. But there will be a regular opportunity for areas to come forward and have their uh, their tier status reassessed. And just a reminder of the measures that will be used to make that decision. They were set out in the winter plan, published the week before last. They will look at their headline cases, the infection rate in the over 60s, which is why I've focused on that today, our testing positivity. Really important to consider the local impact that COVID's having on the health and care system. And they'll also consider the direction of travel in those measures and the trajectory. So that just gives you an indication of the, the way that that decision would be made. Bringing it back to local outbreak management, um, as I've said, our focus all the way along has been on tier one contact tracing. We've developed a response team through the Public Health Dorset team, which has been uh, working on a 24-7 basis, including with an out of hours rotor to support those high risk settings with managing incidents and outbreaks. The assurance around that activity has been through the Health Protection Board, which meets weekly. And we've got into a very effective rhythm with the EpiCell considering the local situation on the Thursday, developing a report over the weekend, which is then used by the Health Protection Board to assess the effectiveness of our controls and also to discuss any messages that need to be um, sent from the Health Protection Board in, in our SITREP, which goes to other meetings across the system. And as we've headed into the second wave, I think my reflection is comms and engagement has been even more important. So compared with the first phase of the pandemic, I think um, continuing to work with the public um, on continuing to highlight those areas where we still need the the trust and the ability of the public to show a really, really high degree of compliance is, is more important than ever before. The local outbreak engagement board has been meeting, particularly as we started to see an escalation in cases, yeah. to look at agreeing messaging under the plans as we escalated and also on exit from lockdown. I think that's worked really well. We've had some good discussions in there and it's been a useful forum just to make sure that those messages are consistent. Um, and again, working with colleagues in Dorset Council through the LRF footprint, that's been a really effective way of making sure that we're looking at the, the natural economy, if you like, not just a BCP Council, but um, the wider Dorset area. Above all, remembering that our health and care system is, is pan-Dorset. So to have different decisions around the tiering system across both councils probably would not have been helpful at this stage. Um, useful to be able to uh, uh, certainly have those discussions through the engagement board and I think just a message from me I mean this is my personal view I don't think that the economy and public health are as binary a choice as sometimes they are made out to be um, totally understand that some of the restrictive measures are not good for the economy but unless we get a grip on the infections and unless we get a grip on the pandemic and bring them down um, it's going to be very very difficult to see that return to normality with any degree of consistency. So just a little bit on some of the communications and engagement that's planned uh, over the holiday period. Um, colleagues uh, such as Kirsty Hillio and the Warning and Informing Group, Georgia Turner, have all been involved in thinking through how we're going to get our messaging right. Uh, I think the key thing is to look forward, not back at the lockdown. And they've described a four strand approach using the let's get there safely uh, taglines and hashtag stop the spread and it's really aimed at encouraging people to follow the guidelines so that we can enjoy Christmas activities albeit a little bit differently but but as safely as possible. So the four uh, assets that are being developed are uh, graphics to support uh, helping people understand what they can do safely, there's the ability to localise those with clear calls to action which link back to communities so you can brand them um, around smaller geographies. The 
series of graphics that are aimed at families on how to follow the guidelines and still have fun. Really, really important that we can show people what they can do, not talk all the time about what people can't do. And again, trying to uh, sort of put those together with a, a sort of festive spirit. There's a Christmas Advent countdown going on at the moment, which gives tips every day on how people can look after their physical and mental well-being throughout the period, uh, recognising that it, it is it has been a difficult time. And then finally, just uh, a, a, a finishing note from me about the medium term outlook. I know that obviously there's a lot of um, there's a lot of hope now that there's been a vaccine licensed and obviously the, the plans for rolling that out are well underway. There are new testing technologies coming down the pipeline. So the ability of rapid antigen flow tests, those have been going out to NHS partners. Uh, there's the possibility that they'll be sent to our care sector very soon to support safer visiting. Huge number of initiatives um, increasing access to those tests. But I would say I think we're still in for a difficult winter. Uh, it remains to be seen how effective the control measures under tier two will be over the next few weeks. We hope that they'll be sufficient to continue to bring infection rates down. But obviously, we do need to keep a very close eye on our local data and see where we are on the other side of the holiday period. And with that in mind, the Health Protection Board is now engaged on three priority work programmes under the Contain Outbreak Management Fund, which is additional financial support that's come in to support Council's response to COVID-19. And our priority work programmes will be focusing around behavioural insights, recognising how important it is to, to tackle those behaviours uh, more specifically. The general messaging is good, does lose effectiveness over time, and I think we are definitely starting to see messaging fatigue. So being more specific about some of the behaviours that we'd like to really target, we think is going to be really important over the next few months. We're going to uh, be in a local contact tracing partnership with NHS Test and Trace. So this is the further development of the service that's been happening uh, through the customer services at BCP Council to contact people who've tested positive and offer a welfare check. Uh, that will be further developed to make sure that we can reach people in a more timely fashion. So through that partnership, we will be starting to follow up people after 24 hours. Um, and I think that's uh, really important to have that, that local offer of support there and then as early as possible. And the third initiative that we'll be bringing forward is looking how to deploy those rapid tests in very specific settings. So uh, I think there is definitely hope on the horizon, um, but we're still likely to see COVID-19 affecting particularly high risk settings for some time to come. But overall, I'm hugely, hugely pleased and very, very thankful for all the support that we've had from a, a huge range of partners to, to get this response stood up. Um, we're in a good place, but we do need to, to sort of keep our foot to the floor, as it were, particularly on those priority work programmes. Thank you very much, Chair. Sam, thank you very much um, for that. It's not the first time that any of us will have seen you present, um, and indeed we're, I think we see it several times a week, um, and that's indicative of the um, huge amount of work that goes on um, from public health, um, not only within your own area, but in informing partners and informing the public. So I'd certainly like um, to, to recognise um, the work that's gone on and to thank you and your team for, for always being there and always being able to give us reliable, up-to-date information. And also to the members of the Health Protection Board for, for taking on that regular weekly um, uh, um, the weekly meeting where all that stuff gets put together in one place and a position is is understood. So to all those partners, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to open up to any questions or um, comments for Sam. Um, there are many, many people um, at this meeting who um, are, are immensely busy in the response to this um, situation um, and now would be a great time to hear from you if you've got any questions on that or messages that you think um, require wider distribution. I'm seeing no hands. Um, if we're all content 
um, to move on, but I'm very, very keen that we shouldn't uh, rush away from this. I'm sure, Sam, actually we will need to go back to the content um, in one way or another in our future discussion. So we have got you for the whole meeting, haven't we? Um, yeah, because this is absolutely. the, I, I think perhaps this is the the, con, the shared context in which we're op, um, operating. Um, and therefore, if nobody is um, has any uh, particular questions, then uh, we should move on or indeed move back to item eight. Um, and apologies while I try to call this up, um, the right part of the agenda. And um, I think, Jan, would you be prepared to um, introduce the report? We're looking at the um, planning our, and the delivery of the health and wellbeing strategy, which was, of course, adopted um, at the last meeting and then onwardly adopted by uh, Cabinet. So this is really where we start to um, look at delivering. So, Jan, as the corporate director, could you kindly introduce the report and guide us through um, our, our, our various elements of it? Thank you very much, Chair. So, um, as, as you've just said, the strategy was agreed by the Health and Wellbeing Board on the 3rd of September at its last meeting, um, meeting before last. It's probably just useful to um, just review the process that was used to get to the strategy because we've got new board members with us today. So, um, the strategy was developed collectively by the board using both development and formal meetings. Um, the strategy is set in the context of the BCP Council's corporate strategy, where the vision is to create a vibrant, vibrant communities with excellent quality of life, where everyone plays an active role. In order to develop the strategy, there was uh, use of uh, data, particularly data that's included in the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which public health colleagues um, helped develop for all partners to help us really look at the key um, demographic and equality issues uh, within uh, the BCP Council area. And it would be true to say that um, the strategy was further shaped uh, earlier in 2020 as uh, the pandemic uh, emerged and as we've learned around uh, some of the major impacts in terms of, of COVID. Um, in line with the uh, board's main purpose, which is to improve health and well-being and reduce inequalities, the strategy, uh, the board agreed that the strategy would have um, one major, have a number of major overarching aims. The first of these is to increase healthy life expectancy uh, for our population. Interestingly, at the moment, our healthy life expectancy is 63 years actual life expectancy is 80 for men and 83 for women. Um, and underneath that aim to increase healthy life expectancy is a real commitment to need to tackle the, the issues and the inequalities, which mean that um, certain members of our, our communities and our residents will have less uh, long periods of healthy life expectancy. There's a further aim is that we work together as partners to improve health and well-being, and particularly engage our local communities and residents in all of our work, and that we particularly focus on those who are most disadvantaged. A third aim is to have a real focus on the outcomes for children young, and young people, so that children and young people can have the best start in life. That's a real acknowledgement that the basis of good health and well-being will start um, through uh, the various, very earliest part of children's um, of, of our of our lives as children and young people, and the fourth element was a commitment to address issues of climate change uh, in the activities of the board. So, with those aims in mind, the board has developed three priorities, which are empowering communities, <coughs> promoting healthy lives and supporting and challenging the collective work that we do. And uh, within that, we picked out a number of things that were really key for partners where we thought um, we really needed to improve um, outcomes or, in, or ensure that real strategic, that the major strategic changes that were happening led to improved health and well-being in the long term. 
and that would be particularly true of the very significant changes that are happening in health and, and care and related services um, within our local area. Um, so today what we're going to do, what we're presenting is uh, the initial delivery plan to deliver our, our aims and priorities. Uh, we're going to go through each of the priorities and people, different people are going to present different aspects of those priorities. At the end, we'll come back to the recommendations. So one of the recommendations is that we're going to shape our forward plan for our, both our development and formal sessions of the board uh, around the delivery plan. So as we go through, we will we will look at various uh, suggestions and recommendations about how we shape the forward plan in the light of the delivery plan for our meetings. Um, and then also um, to have a conversation about the concept of champions. So there was a, a, a decision at the board on the 3rd of September that various elements of the plan might be championed by members of the board. So it would be good to have a discussion at the end of the presentation about that concept and whether there is enthusiasm to take forward the champion role. So at this point, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about empowering community priorities. Brilliant. Thank you, Jan, for that um, that introduction and uh, reminder to keep our minds uh, focused on on those recommendations. Um, just ahead of that, um, before we invite Kate and Kat, um, just to set out, I think what we'll do is take each one of those three priorities, um, have a presentation and then a brief discussion about them. I suspect we could spend a long time talking about each and every one, so we will need to be uh, to keep an eye on the time and certainly make sure that we leave plenty of time for discussion of the third one. Um, but also I'd like to draw members um, attention to the second recommendation um, that we have to consider. Um, and this is one that has been brought forward by a, a um, perhaps a slight change of focus or indeed I, I would hope a recognition of the circumstances in which we find ourselves by the new administration and that's uh, that's in relation to the promoting healthy lives priority those two themes of improving mental health and eliminating and eliminating food that should be insecurity i would have thought are delivered um concurrently um for the duration of the strategy i think as soon as we hear kat and kate talk about um some of uh, their work and then sam and paul um uh, talking about theirs i hope that we will be able to agree that they are both priorities for us um, and that we need to um uh, deliver them concurrently so um kate kat are you both here i believe you are um and um uh, the uh, the screen is yours i suppose is the way to introduce this i don't know if you've got some um some slides but over to you now thank you uh, chair no um i haven't got slides i'm just going to talk through the report um so just um, because there are some new members, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Kate Ryan, the Corporate Director for Environment and Communities at BCP Council. Um, just wanted to take um, members of the board back to a time in November 2019 um, when we uh, were in Christchurch uh, Council offices and we had a development session where we um, where we looked at our communities, we looked at um, maps, we looked at geographies, um, we looked at the indices of multiple deprivation um, that came out in September. And as a range of partners talked about our priorities and how we worked in those communities. Um, and this, this priority in, in the strategy really draws on those initial conversations and clearly an awful lot of work um, from legacy councils and partners. Um, so over the period while the strategy was being developed, um, clearly partners were working with communities of high need, um, but in, in particularly a COVID uh, related response. So I think from our perspective now um, for BCP Council, this is a real chance as we come out uh, and we understand our communities are going to be in a very different place next year th than they were in 2019 uh, to, to re-engage in both our partnership structures, but also more importantly, uh, really understanding the needs and the priorities of those communities because this priority is very much about engaging and empowering communities uh, and working with them uh, as an approach. 
Um, so the report outlines um, the, the areas um, with the greatest need, um, and that's based on those um, in the 10% category of most deprived areas across BCP. Um, so in paragraph five, that outlines that that's Boscombe West, Townsend, Eastcliff, Springbourne, Kinson and Bourne. And um, we have already, um, as, you, as you might imagine, um, been working in partnership in those areas for some time. Um, but what we need to do, I think, and what I'd be asking you as, as board members to do is commit to reinvigorate those partnerships. Um, we have um, the Boscombe Regeneration Partnership, which is very much focused at the moment on delivering the Towns Fund opportunity, but we do want to also ensure that this agenda in terms of the health inequalities is absolutely at the heart of that partnership um, and picking that up. And then the West Howe Partnership, which is outlined in paragraph eight, um, that, that again is something that we would like to reinvigorate and gain your commitment to send um, appropriate representatives who can really put a lot of energy and time in, into pushing this work forwards now across those communities and neighbouring areas as well because it's not necessarily a tight geography. Um, the report also goes on to talk about how we really need to, um, to, um, to commission a strategic area assessment for West Howe and um, we've, we've got one that was produced quite recently for Boscombe and again I think it's something where we need to ask for your support for, for partner analysts um, and, and data information to also uh, feed into that process so that we we make sure that we all have a collective understanding of those communities what the issues are um, and and potentially from the public sector, where, where is our focus and priorities all in order to address um, health inequalities and a range of other outcomes. Um, so, so that's the proposal that, that we'd like to put before you. I think it's clear that there are many other communities of need. Um, so there are communities that are not in the most entrenched areas, but, but we know that those communities are struggling. Um, we've seen new communities of need emerging from the current COVID situation and the economic context. And then we know that there's different communities uh, in, in terms of um, different equality considerations and so on that do not necessarily fit these geographies. So I just wanted to reflect that. Um, but what this is, is a commitment to start in our most entrenched areas of need. Uh, and then as we move forwards and learn what really works, um, we, can, we can then expand uh, and, and move forwards in those other areas. Um, so we've had initial conversations with public health colleagues um, around approaches that may work and we want to make sure that we learn the lessons from previous work that has happened in the, those areas uh, in terms of where we really can get the best outcomes for those communities. Um, so we're looking at, at, at different models and, and basically this is a, a, an invitation to the board um, to, um, to make sure that, that you're plugged into that when the invitations come out and that um, your, your key leads um, work with us in those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So that's a save the date um, message to, uh, to our partners. Any questions or comments for that? I know um, there are um, some members of this board who are very active in at least one of those um, uh, priority neighbourhoods. Um, I wonder if they'd like to um, make any comment. Councillor Bobby Dove, I can see your hand raised. Hi, thank you, Sarah. I'm not going to comment as, as one of the partners that you were talking about. But I do have a query, if that's OK, please. Um, on page 34, we talk about supporting our communities um, and suicide prevention, obviously, in the first paragraph. And then we talk about women who experience domestic abuse. And I just had been doing a little bit of background on this. And when we look at young adults between 18 to 28 years, almost 24% of those had experienced violence in their relationship, which is a staggering amount. Um, I didn't realise, particularly in our young cohort, it is quite as much as, as that. And 49.7% of those were reciprocally violent. In the non-reciprocal violent relationships, women were the perpetrators of more than 70%. The caveat is, of course, 
injury is mostly caused upon women in heterosexual relationships. Um, whilst we know that we lose people, sadly, through domestic violence, generally tend to be women, we do lose men through domestic violence, generally, traditionally, rather sadly, through suicide. And I just wondered, therefore, why we were co um, concentrating on women who experience domestic abuse, given how underreported male domestic violence and heterosexual relationship is so, so poor. Thank you. So, Kate, are you happy to reply? I'm not the lead on, on the suicide prevention work, but um, I know um, Kat and my team is involved, or perhaps somebody else um, who's who's been working on, on that section could, could come in. Sam, is this a, perhaps something for public health? Yeah, I, I don't have a huge amount of expertise about that particular statistics, but I, I think that's uh, exactly the kind of input that would be really, really helpful in shaping the delivery plan. So the initial report was pulled together to give a flavour of some of the existing work and the existing programmes that are already going on. But I think as Paul and I would hope to say in our introduction around the mental health work, we'd really be keen to hear how that needs to be shaped and if we can be more specific about what needs to be highlighted and flagged, then absolutely, I think it's, it's well worth looking at that. Thank you very much, Karen. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make a comment on um, item 13 on uh, on page 32, uh, in particular about acid-based community development. And I know that uh, Karen Loftus is on this call and she is absolutely the expert in this area. Um, but it was just to say that we have been having quite a lot of conversations about ABCD and there's a real um, willingness in the council um, to really ramp this up um, starting from next year. So I didn't know if Karen wanted to comment anything, but just to say that on behalf of the council it is something that we're really, really keen um, to, to try and find some resource and to uh, and to ramp up. Thank you. Karen, thank you. That's a, a very um, clear invitation to, um, <laughs> to come and speak. Yes, um, thank you, Councillor Ramson. I don't know about expert, but um, enthusiastic, I think, probably. Um, just to say that I have been with um, with Councillor Kelly um, um, how we can progress um, the um, asset based community development that will be able to get the director for nurture development Paul Mac Russell to come and run have a session maybe with us um, to talk about how we might want to consider that going forward. So um, that, that is uh, with Councillor Kelly with Councillor Jane Kelly at the moment. Thank you, Karen. Um, Mark, Mark Callahan. Sorry, I can I can now see where you are. I just wondered whether you wanted to make any comments on um, uh, the, the the beginning of the conversation that Bobby Dove has kicked off around um, young people, both as victims and perpetrators um, of domestic abuse, um, and really to give perhaps this board some. Um, your reflections on that and then there is the obvious question about whether there are the appropriate links into um, the um, uh, the youth justice program um, and so on. So, so I think uh, first off is that we uh, uh, of course there's higher incidence in domestic abuse um, as outlined in terms of um, female members in domestic abuse but I think from a policing perspective we we operate on a you know a a very um sort of high high integrity as we all do as partners and we'll treat we'll treat a victim on the basis we, we do know just generally um in some of the so even if you look at some of the men's health work that we're doing at the moment and domestic abuse in men's health is is something uh, i'm interested in um is actually um some victims are uh, less willing to come forwards so I think all the services are there, the support is there, and certainly when people step forward, they get just as good a service, whether you're male or female, or whether whichever age bracket that you fall into. Um, I think some of this is about culturally um, mm -hmm. people willing to step forward, and we've seen that previously with historic rape, haven't we? And we've, we've you know, we've done huge amounts of work about um, bringing people forward and giving them trust and confidence in reporting. Um, so uh, we, we're very alive to it. We, we monitor. 
um, domestic abuse um, victims, uh, age groups, and also from a, um, you know, from um, male, female, etc., gender um, side of things. So of course, it's not just you know, there's there's a whole different range of characteristics that we need to consider in this and making sure we offer those services. Um, and of course, that then links into wider um, sort of the criminal justice aspect of things um, in terms of the criminal things. But um, some of the work that we do and we do extensively with partners is about actually how to put intervention in. How do we do offend, you know, a perpetrator offender program? So we've got one called the drive program that we're looking at. There's up to you already in place a number of interventions, um, prevention being a key part of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we know from from a COVID point of view, we haven't necessarily seen an increase in domestic violence, as in physical assault, but we have seen an increase in domestic incidents. So actually, it's very important at the very early stages when we start getting involved in domestic incidents to go and look with a view of, you know, that professional curiosity and how we can put an intervention in place there before it escalates. And certainly from a policing perspective, and it's it's with partnership training as well, in January this year, we've got a significant um, DA matters training program and also vulnerability pro and training program for police officers and um, police staff and partners are involved in that as well about raising awareness around domestic abuse. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot, but it's been really helpful to have that that input. I suppose one reflection is it's, it's potentially the next taboo, isn't it? As we will, you know, we'll get to the point where um, uh, later on in the agenda when we'll be talking about mental health. And I think collectively we are better at talking about it than we have been. We're not completely there yet, um, but there are still things that we need to to bring out and call them what they are. Um, and, you know, at that point you can give people, as you say, a bit more confidence um, that they will be listened to um, and that it's okay to talk about it. Absolutely. Yeah, there's still lots to do, but we, I think we've also come on strides. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, Kate, I'm sorry, I was slightly taken um, by uh, one of your points, which was about um, we need to build on lessons learned from public health. Um, and in terms of looking at your next 10% down, um, I suppose the question for us as a board is whether there is stuff that we can pick up that has worked. Um, and perhaps put put in at the appropriate time into um, into those communities. Where is where where is that piece of information? Um, I, I, mean, I, th I think it's something that that we need to develop and absolutely make sure that while we're focused on the on the two areas that are outlined in the report, that that we clearly share the best practice and and the learning to our work that we do do with those communities, just perhaps not in quite such a formal way, but but working with community groups and organisations across the range of partners so one of the one of the approaches that we're looking at with public health is is this uh, population intervention which looks at a range of different ways that you can support communities from kind of civic programs through to really empowering uh, and supporting the community which would be in the world of, of Karen and, and the CVS and the myriad of community organizations that absolutely are there and work and know their communities better that, that, than we do um, and and then there's the sort of work that we do in services to provide the relevant support in communities and I think some of some of that we can bring together in in a, in a formal way um, but actually when we all start perhaps I think the challenge for us is to is to as a group um, move on a journey where we understand we're going to work uh, and how we talk about that and how we achieve together um, so so I think that that's where I'm hopeful that that approach is going to mean that we can start understanding and really being very clear about how we are working in those communities and then we'll be able to you know share that in into all of our work um, in different areas um, whether we're ward members or community organizations or partners. Thank you Kate. Um, Bobby Ness. Um, no, thank you. I have another question, if that's OK, though, please. Thank you. OK, all right. Yes, yeah, sorry, that was a go ahead. All right. <laughs> I wasn't clear. I realise that now. Yeah, thank you. Um, at the bottom of page 35, when we talk about the suicide um, agenda, and um, it, I mean, we have to acknowledge that someone who is living um, with, alongside and looking after somebody who 
is experiencing that that very dark side of mental health acting on their well-being um so i just wondered whether stage two provided support for family members and a bid to relieve support at stage three but also if they have the support at stage two may not blame themselves as much and in, in, in unfortunately a family member as well but if stage three were to happen they know that they had the tools to do everything that they could thank you kate did you want to come back on this uh, a response here from public health just to put this in the context there is um the um suicide prevention strategy is still in preparation um so it may be that public health might want to um take that away um if we haven't got all the answers right here, right now. So, sorry, Sam, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but um, I wonder if you could kindly respond. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. And I think it's another good observation, Councillor Dove. And one of the uh, challenges, I think, with the suicide prevention agenda is making sure that we've got a coherent approach. So there are lots and lots of initiatives. There's the BCP Council Suicide Prevention Plan, which is will be coming to Cabinet. But we also have a, a multi-agency suicide prevention group that's been working uh, to develop a number of initiatives. So it's it's not just about some of the work that's going on with communities, the real-time surveillance and working with people who are right at the sort of top of the triangle in terms of acuity, if you like. Um, there are many, many other ways that we can get into increasing awareness of the issue. Um, and as part of that, understanding the impact that it has, as you absolutely say, on, on partners, families and loved ones, because there's a often a much bigger set of issues behind the, you know, the actual act or the attempt itself. So absolutely take that on board. Brilliant. Thank you. If we're Kate, yes. Hi. Sorry, I was, I was probably anticipating where you may be going. I, I just wondered, we sort of uh, jumped over the, the, the section around food insecurity and I I know, I just wondered if you'd like to hear from Kat um, on that. You did indeed anticipate where I was going. Um, yes, please, Kat. And then I wonder, um, we'll perhaps see how, um, how we're going for time, but we might run straight then on to Sam and Paul so that we can consider those two things. I know they're very different, um, but perhaps if we just move from one to the other and then go back to questions. Um, Kat, over to you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, so just to fill those in who aren't aware, um, in the autumn of 2019, we held a Dorset Hidden Hunger event um, at Upton House, and that brought together a, a wide range of partners from across BCP and Dorset who were actively involved in either uh, public health or food or food related activities to try and look at what are the barriers to reducing food inequality. So building on that work, we um, employed a community food coordinator. Um, she came into post about a week before we went into lockdown. Um, I'd like to say that we planned that perfectly, um, but her role has been absolutely fundamental in making sure we've been able to support our vulnerable communities throughout the pandemic. So the uh, Access to Food Partnership, which was formed very much in response to the pandemic now has over 130 different partners who are involved in um, helping people to access food in one way or another. That could be through community fridges, um, through pantries, through um, meal clubs in order to get cooked meals to vulnerable residents or, or any other activities that are taking place at a neighbourhood grassroots level. So those partners come together virtually at the moment to share knowledge, best practice and identify ways to improve local community food support. The partnership got, has got a, a set of foundations which all partners are signed up to. And the fundamental principle, everyone has enough food for themselves and their family all the time. Food is nutritious and safe. Food is culturally acceptable and sourced in a way that doesn't compromise people's dignity, self-respect or human rights. That people can live in a neighbourhood that provides good, affordable food options and that people's lived experiences of food insecurity and food poverty are heard in decision making that works towards food security. 
So we've also developed the access to food map, which um, isn't in the public domain quite yet. We're just working on that now, but it's available to a wide range of um, practitioners um, and people who are work working in food insecurity uh, projects. It's literally a, a virtual map that you can go on to. Um, you can zoom into your local area, see the wide range of different food provisions that are in place. You can even um, move a little toggle and it will show you exactly which food provision is open now so that if a, a school practitioner or someone is working with someone who's in food insecurity right that moment, um, we can actively find somewhere to source food for them in that way. Um, at the moment, the Access to Food group is very much focused on Christmas, um, making sure that there is a, an adequate supply for people as we go through the, the school ho holidays, the bank holidays. Um, it's looking at mapping all of that existing provision um, so that we can have a cohesive idea of what's happening out there. But equally, where are the gaps? Where do we need to work with our partners and our other organisations to make sure that we fill those gaps um, so that nobody goes hungry at Christmas? We're also looking um, at the other side of it. It is Christmas and it's a time for gifting. So we know a lot of people want to gift their time. Perhaps they want to give some items. Perhaps they want to give some money. But we want to make sure that's coordinated in the best way to do that so that actually we're getting that help to, to where it really is needed rather than perhaps we might have a rush of everybody trying to do a cooked meal, but we don't actually have a lot of people who need that cooked meal. So our focus at the moment is very much on Christmas, but we're very aware as we move past Christmas, um, we'll be looking very much at the recovery within the community. Um, how can we develop these sustainable routes to food? We don't want to be in a situation where we, we think it's acceptable for people to continually need handouts to, to continue excuse me, continually need to go to food banks. Um, how can we work with those, those families and those help holds to help them out of that circle? And key to that is about changing the way we have the conversation around food insecurity, around food poverty. Um, we have to stop it almost being that dirty little secret that people can't step forward and ask for help because they're ashamed of it. And I think the golden opportunity now, when we're in such a, a crisis and a pandemic, where so many people are affected by that way, this is the chance chance for us to really push that forward um, and change the way that people think about that to make it acceptable for people to come forward and say, hey, I need a little bit of help. Thank you. Kat, thank you very much for that whistle stop tour. And I, I know from our almost daily conversations how much work is going on to this, how, how embedded this partnership is um, between um, all the public services and the uh, the voluntary service in particular. And I do wonder whether Karen Loftus might um, uh, like just to say a couple of words from, from that sector's perspective, because they are in many senses the delivery arm um, of, uh, of much of what goes on. Um, Karen, you have a, a legion of volunteers behind you, and I wonder if you'd like perhaps to speak on, on their behalf. Gosh. Um... Well, yes, I think um, what I would like to say um, to everyone is why I think this is work works is because we work together. We work in partnership and we work collaboratively. So we work collaboratively as a sector with each other. But um, the, the thing that I think that the through the pandemic has been a positive and I'm trying to pull some positive legacies from this is actually it's really enhanced the way that different organizations are working together and pulling what you can do when you have to do things really really quickly which is what we have done so although we've had a fantastic community response across the BCP area with over 3,300 people came forward, we had 3,000 people came forward in the first weekend wanting to help. And I spoke to some of them and, you know, they were just saying to me, Karen, we just wanted to do something. We felt we just wanted to put something back into our community. So what we have now is over a thousand volunteers across the across the whole conurbation who still want to help and still want to stand up and still want to support their community, along with some fantastic community groups, established charities who have literally turned themselves inside out to continue to provide services in a different way and an innovative way, joining up. So it, it's been amazing, really. And, the, and the, the food group, I think, is a shining example of this, of how it's been a whole, across the whole conurbation, working in different with people that maybe hadn't worked as closely together before, now are 
and our meeting up and saying, how can we do this? What can we do? And being really responsive, not just reactive, but actually being really responsive. And I really look forward to how we move forward in the next stage. And I would really commend what Kat is saying around trying to get underneath why we're in, why some people need to be accessing food banks and putting in support around that so that we don't get that, so people don't get to that stage. Um, and I, I think we would be very interested in being involved with that. But yeah, it's all about partnership working. It's absolutely brilliant. It's been an amazing co-production. The, the response from, um, from the volunteers who you've coordinated has been nothing less than magnificent. Um, but going back to areas of need, I wonder whether perhaps Sam and Paul, you could give us your, your thoughts on um, improving mental health. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll just invite Paul to come on camera. I'm going to provide a very, very brief introduction to the topic um, and just a bit of context. With one eye on the recommendations in the paper, I really hope the board members would support this being one of the uh, two priority themes under promoting healthy lives. And I think it probably doesn't need me to remind people of the current importance of focusing on mental health at this time. If you just look at the statistics from the Office of National Statistics that have been doing regular surveys throughout the pandemic, you can see just how uh, different parts of our community have been affected um, by the, the sort of insecurity and the, the situation that we found ourselves in. But, but just before I bring Paul in, I was just going to sort of provide a little bit of a, a look back, really. Over the past two or three years, um, we've regularly reported to the Health and Wellbeing Board on the Prevention at Scale initiative. And a big chunk of that work involved the prevention and promotion of good mental health throughout through various means. The approach that we adopted at the time was one of working alongside organisations and communities to try to improve understanding skills and resilience through a whole range of offers. And some examples of those capacity building initiatives are set out in the report before you today. So the work continues, but as we come to the board today, I hope that members will agree on the importance of keeping this in focus. And one of the conversations that we want to have today, which Paul will lead, is what should we sharpen up on and how should we engage with the board to really understand what we should focus on in the delivery plan in a way that the board can really add value. Because some of this work is ongoing anyway, there are many organisations involved in it, but we really wanted to start that conversation today. Uh, and I think Paul's got a couple of ideas as to how we could really hone in on what's important. Over to you, Paul. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the the report, um, following on from Sam's comments there, the, the report before us um, introduces some uh, initiatives that we might look to develop around supporting um, mental well-being, improving mental health. Um, and, and many of these, I think, are informed by or influenced by the recent experience of uh, a COVID pandemic, uh, where clearly there has been uh, incredible amounts of stress and strain experienced by individuals, by households, uh, by many of us in our work context as well, um, work-related uh, stress being in relation to delivering services or perhaps suffering from being in a work environment that's uh, struggling as a result of the pandemic and fear of losing one's job. So, so with those sort of that, that background in mind, um, uh, initial plans have looked to be developed around sort of three key themes. Uh, these are detailed in the report. The first theme uh, being one of um, supporting our communities uh, and there's extensive wellbeing comms planned uh, over the next few months, uh, an extension of the Live Well Dorset coaching offer and Dorset Mental Health um, Foundation uh, in particular doing some work around bereavement support. Uh, and there's also a, a, a strand of work there identified that talks about uh, particularly children and young people and additional support uh, to be provided within educational establishments. Uh, the second sort of key theme uh, brings a bit more of a focus on staff and their well-being. Uh, many of the many of you on the board will be representing organisations that have 
uh, have experienced uh, lots of stress and strain over the last few months um, and uh, a lot of staff have come together over recent months to develop online and training support for staff uh, in, in a bid to um, support staff and increase an emphasis on resilience. Uh, many organisations also provide organisational counselling supports to staff. So it's important that that emphasis, I think, is continued. Um, clearly, caring, kindness perhaps begins with our staff and then staff that are well supported and cared for are able to conduct their, their, their roles in looking after others better. And the third thing which we touched a bit upon in conversations uh, earlier in the meeting is the uh, work that's going on across partners to develop a suicide action plan. Uh, these plans are developed regularly up and down the country. Uh, I think they have a two yearly refresh cycle. Um, and I think this time round, there'll be clearly an awful lot of emphasis increased on that uh, as a result of the um, COVID pandemic. So, so those three areas give us a sort of starter for 10, perhaps. And uh, going back to something that Jan said earlier, she referred to champions. I think the paper might refer to uh, board level sponsors uh, to support areas of work. Uh, and I wonder, Chair, if we might leave uh, colleagues with the idea of perhaps thinking about um, pulling in some help from partners across the board uh, to work with us as additional sponsors or champions initially on a, a task and finish type basis to form a group uh, to look at this particular area around improving mental well-being and help us think through whether there are any other opportunities uh, for us to do some work in this field um, particularly I guess if there's opportunities for quick wins um, and whether there's any gaps that we, that we might need to address in particular. Uh, and perhaps it would be possible for us to look to pull together some uh, colleagues across the board, quick task and finish group, and that that might help us generate some sort of a start for 10 that we could bring back to a development session and then really finesse the plan that's in front of us today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. That's, um, thank you to everyone, actually, again, for uh, condensing uh, your day lives into um, a, a few paragraphs really to give us a, a flavour of what it is we need to consider as a board. So happy to take questions and comments on uh, this whole section around promoting healthier lifestyles um, on, on either the food poverty or the mental health. And if I don't see any volunteers, then <laughs> there may be some shoulder tapping that goes on. I think it would be helpful. Thank you, Louise. Hello, Louise. Thanks, Chair. Just, just in response to that last request for volunteers, um, I'd be keen to have Health Watch involved yeah. in looking at mental health. We've got a, a new youth worker um, working with us, Lindsay, and we'll be launching a young listeners project in January recruiting a group of young people who we're going to support to develop some engagement opportunities next year so that they'll go out and gather feedback from their peers and find out what young people um, want from health and care services. I imagine mental health will form a big part of that project. Um, I'm just guessing it's the project will be theirs, but I, I would imagine mental health will be part of it. So it'd be great to have them involved. So please include us. That would be very Thanks. welcome. Thank you. I, I do wonder whether we might have some um, some comments. Clearly, um, primary care um, is often the place where people, well, clearly it's in the name, uh, will have a view on how much of an issue this is, how people are presenting um, through primary care, through the period of the pandemic, or indeed just through the 2020s. Um, so it'd be very interesting to hear from somebody from the CCG um, about um, their views on this. Sorry, Mafid, I didn't see your hand there. I'm still getting used to the technology. Mafid. Well, okay, yeah. Um, I do represent the CCG, but also um, I'm a GP in. Uh, yeah. Uh, we cover a, a, a big network across uh, Boscombe, 
um, Bournemouth East, Southbourne and Christchurch. And since uh, the uh, pandemic, we, we have seen a huge increase in mental health issues. Um, um, I do clinics and mostly half of my clinics are anxiety, depression, so, isolation. I lost my job. I want to kill myself. And uh, so the demand, I think, has gone really high up. Um, and we are struggling in um, finding ways of coping with it because um, I think the other services also overwhelmed as well. So it would be good to have some kind of uh, a plan or um, low level uh, community um, approach to, to all of this. Thank you for that, Richard. Oh, apologies, Sean, your name popped up first. Um, and yeah. then Richard. Yeah, I guess from an education point of view, listening into obviously what the contribution is and, and, and different aspects of it, all of it relates to education in terms of that early stages of uh, well-being and, 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 and looking at it. And I guess from my point of view, uh, certainly education from a, from a mental health point of view, a uh, massive issue in schools. Uh, my schools in our trust are all in the areas uh, that were, you know, the Boscombe, the Kinson, the Bourne. That's where our schools are. So it taps into also uh, the deprivation as well as uh, the whole aspect of it. And I think for us, in terms of mental health um, and well-being, is strands across our trust with our staff and with our with our pupils. So you know, we we do the five steps to well-being. We continue to look at ways of supporting um, our staff and our pupils. We have well-being champions. We do all those those aspects of things that. Um, you know, are really important. I think for us, it's the uh, what just got touched on by Paul. Really, it's the um, oh, sorry, the the last gentleman. It's the with mental health, we we can see what works, and young people go up and down, probably like adults do, in terms of you know there are there are some um, instances that happen that make them then go backwards, so they can be on an upward trajectory, and they think that things are going well, and then there's an adverse something happens and then they go backwards. And I think we always are dealing with a high percentage of youngsters, but some of them are in a good place, but then some of them come back. And so you're, you're always in that overwhelming feeling of the resources don't meet the need. It's not that what you're doing doesn't help individuals, but mm. there's just not enough resources to keep the flow of the need going. So I think certainly in terms of a, a task and finish around looking at how, how education can, uh, you know, could fit into from an early stage of those youngsters coming in at, you know, the age of three to our schools and, and going outwards. Actually, you know, what are we doing that that is there's some positives, but also linking in with what's in the community that we can signpost our, uh, our families, because I think for us, it's the adults who are sit behind the family so we can deal with the children and make them feel better on a day-to-day -day basis with their self-esteem, but they go back into the families and it's signposting, well, what are those families have got in their community for them to be able to tap into? What's what's available to them? So in a way we can sort of, you know, join the join the circles more in terms of looking at it. And I think from my perspective, that would that would uh, be something I'd you know, really like to bring to the table to contribute to a task and finish and look at that. That's terrific, Sean. Thank you. That may be the reason that we thought we were so thrilled to have you on the board. Um, Richard, uh, Richard Jenkinson now. Uh, yes, I mean, in terms of the, 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 the sort of pressure on primary care and issues with mental health, I would echo um, what Mathid said, you know, the, the demands are enormous at the moment. Um, I, I mean, one thing that primary care networks have enabled um, practices and groups of practices to do is to invest in additional roles within primary care. And so primary care networks have been able to engage people called social prescribers who are very helpful in terms of dealing with mental health problems that arise because of loss of job, because of issues with benefits um, and signposting people with things like food poverty. So there is this workforce out there in primary care now and also through the uh, help and care which um, are providing that service to a lot of networks and um, these this could be a resource to link into in terms of um, you know looking at looking at the strategy that's a really helpful um, uh, thought Richard thank you because it may well well apply um, uh, it, it, in other ways or if we could kind of take the model it may be appropriate elsewhere. Right, I've got Simon Watkins and then Kate, and then mindful of the time, I think we probably need to try and wrap up. Uh, but Simon. So just really just around, um, there is a lot of work very specific 
specifically dealing with mental health at the CCG itself. So I guess it's about not having silo working in that, that, that this actually just ties in very definitely with, with that work that's already going on from a medical perspective. Brilliant. Thank you. And Kate? Thank you, Councillor. I think that's two points really that struck me around the mental health discussion in particular. Um, and thinking from a Dorset healthcare perspective, two points that really did strike home um, and are, are actually heavily discussed in other forums at the moment. And um, so the first was around the focus on staff health and wellbeing. And I think including within that um, our primary care colleagues and health and wellbeing across that wider workforce as a system. Um, and I suspect we are already involved. If not, let me know. But I think that's something that would be um, very keen to support with the work that's ongoing already, Paul. Thank you. Um, and the second point was really reflecting on those links into communities and the wider assets and factors that relate to health and wellbeing. Um, and again, that importance of the link with Dorset Mental Health Forum um, and the bridge then into different support offers in place alongside those community um, community assets. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you, Kate. Um, Paul, I think you've got your answer about your task and finish group. Could I just add one thing in, and this comes from a conversation I was involved in yesterday, and it's um, a quite separate body, but it became increasingly clear that we do need to make some links. Um, and it's around the BCPR cubed um, arrangement, which is a business focused um, group of people coming together. It's about how the, um, the economy should respond. So the R's are um, respond, recover, reimagine, and clearly much of much 2020 has been about um, responding and uh, the recovery in some senses is, is ongoing and some places has yet to start. But there is amongst that a, um, a welfare group um, and the feedback from them yesterday was this is very clearly an issue for um, not just our um, uh, some of our geographic communities where we would expect it to be, but this is being felt amongst um, people who have um, in the past had pretty good um, support networks, um, their own resilience and um, their, their employment status has been part of that um, and while some businesses are doing fine and and some are seeking new um new opportunities some are absolutely struggling um and it's putting a huge amount of pressure on parts of the workforce and parts of us, our communities who have not experienced it before um it's not that they don't have the skills to respond but those um supporting um, initiatives around them don't necessarily exist. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that there is potentially a large group of people who might not have been struggling um, in the same way who are coming forward. Now, I'm very pleased that there is a body through which it's being, um, it's beginning to come forward, but I would think that they absolutely need to be linked in because one of the things that has been fed back is clearly people's job insecurities um, you know, are, are, are well established. I think we can all um, uh, understand and, and they resonate. But for some uh, business owners, uh, they are feeling the responsibility of um, having to lose people uh, extremely um, tough um, and it's impacting on, on their mental health as well. So the point that I, I think I'm making is that this is affecting a whole new band that we might not have considered perhaps a year ago in a different way. Um, but the good thing, as I say, is that they are organised through the welfare group. But I wonder whether you would be um, happy to take um, a representative from that to, to bring in, because um, much of what is said, I'm sure, would be very helpful to them. Councillor Green, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Yep. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've focused particularly on the um, the second half of that um, promoting um, healthier lifestyles, but clearly um, those two things are so um, closely linked and was very clearly um, mentioned from some of our GP colleagues um, that the uh, food insecurity is is a, a, a further element of 
uh, one of the reasons that people are struggling. So um, we will come back to the recommendation on that. So again, looking at the time, um, we now move on to item three, which is partnership working. We have got four subheadings in here, um, but I'd like to take them all together because I do think we want to spend um, a bit of time hearing from, well, enough time hearing from um, the, the very important element about um, ensuring the well-being um, through those significant in the health services and the integration of health and social care. So Elaine, I wonder if I could start with you on um, SEND, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, afternoon, uh, colleagues. So um, as you will see, the brief note that, that um, makes reference to um, the creation of a SEND uh, Improvement Board, which has an independent chair um, from the LGA. That was at our um, request. So what I am proposing is that in in terms of um, line of sight and uh, for the Health and Wellbeing Board, that the uh, current um, arrangements for reporting into the Health and Wellbeing Board were put in place before we had the Improvement Board. So I would suggest that exceptions reports are requested from this board. Um, once you um, have had an opportunity to look at the SEND improvement plan, which I'm very, um, very happy to circulate to board members to give you opportunity to um, come back and ask questions, but also to take an informed view about where you might want to have particular agenda items um, brought back to the Health and Wellbeing Board. So it really is as straightforward as that, Chair. I'm proposing that there is a, a really clear line of um, governance into the Health and Wellbeing Board on the significant issue of SEND. Thank you. That was um, very pacey and helpful and, um, and absolutely relevant. Um, Sally, I just wonder whether as a member of that, uh, that board, you might like to comment on whether you agree that's a sensible way or, or whether you have another view. Thank, thank you, Chair. No, more, more than happy with that. I had some comments. Uh, proposal being um, established. So I think that makes sense. I'm an active member of the um, improvement board, as are some of my other colleagues. So um, and, and we've we've got a you know a real energy to want to make some pace of improvement around this really important area. So I'm supportive of the proposed way forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen any other indicators, so I, I think if everybody's happy, we perhaps might wrap that up in um, uh, in our notes at the end. Oh, I beg your pardon, there, was there a hand? If it was, um, I've lost it and it's gone, um, so let me know um, if anybody does want to come There was up. a dog, I, okay. I, I think it was, uh, no, uh, yeah, that was my dog, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sulking because he's shut out. Um, <laughs> I can't ask it when he's the other side of the door. Um, so swiftly, um, I think we should move on to the safeguarding partnership. Um, Elaine, are you speaking with this along with um, yes. Jan or are you pleased? No, I'll just Thanks. give a very brief update. You will see from the from the note in the in the report that there's um, due consideration being given to um, the arrangements for Dorset and BCP Council. The independent chair, um, Anthony Douglas, has undertaken a um, review and the current, um, and I've got my colleagues actually um, um, marked on the call, so, so Mark, uh, feel free to come in if, if I've missed anything. So the current thinking at the moment is that there will be two uh, separate boards going forward from the 1st of April um, that will be um, place-based um, but there will be some, and this is where the detail always lives, of course, um, is that there needs to be some um, working through of where the crossover points are, because what we're all very keen on is not losing the momentum around, particularly as we talked earlier, um, around domestic abuse, but also complex safeguarding or contextualised safeguarding. You know, there are some... Um, there are some um, areas of um, work that do not know boundaries um, and we need to ensure and that is certainly uh, the appetite from, from my colleagues and I know that Jan's on the call but also from an adult's perspective that we make sure that those interdependencies around understanding what's going on in our conurbations are not lost um, for the impact of improvement going forward. So there, the, there will be a draft report um, being prepared that again there is um will can be shared with the health and wellbeing board and then it will go through due governance process which is ultimately it will land in cabinet 
That's very helpful. Thank you. Mark, did you want to comment on that? Stick your hand up in a minute if you do. Jan, was there anything that you wanted to add? I just wanted to add that in terms of the um, Safeguarding Adults Board, we have been looking at that wider piece about how do the, the community safety and the children's and the adults partnership join where we, we need to, as, as Elaine said, where safeguarding and community safety issues um, are, are one and the same thing. Um, so we have a meeting, um, two meetings next week, we have a a meeting across the, the CCG, the two councils and uh, police with the independent chair of the Adult Safeguard Safeguarding Adults Boards um, to have a discussion about um, uh, next steps. And then we have um, a board meeting uh, on uh, next week as well. So we'll be looking at how we take that forward. The proposal is that the Health and Wellbeing Board would take a paper um, in the spring probably which just sets out how all the partnerships are working together. So that would be the proposal to come back with that, confirming how we're all working and ensuring that where we have interdependencies and the issues are the same, that we've got really good working arrangements. Thank you. Well, that's achieved two things because we've partly um, had that update and we've already started to populate the forward plan. Um, so we will move on, um, no, no further indications, to um, uh, I think, Tim, I wonder if you could lead off the um, the item on really this is a an ongoing issue for the board to um, monitor the significant changes in the configuration of the health services and to see the impact that that's having on our on our residents. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, so the, we've got two main elements in this, really, the sort of the, the community side and the actual uh, acute hospital side. So I'm actually going to ask uh, Sally to cover the community and then uh, Debbie's going to come in with the, the acute hospital. But we'll start with Sally on it. Uh, conscious of time as well, so we'll try to keep it brief. Thank you. Um, we, we've touched and given you a bit of a flavour in, in the in the paper, but I think it's fair to say my GP colleagues have also um, g given you some flavour about the joint working that we've been doing. Uh, we, we've been working for some time now, um, or it's probably for some years, in looking at how we can start to understand our populations better and how we then bring our services together to provide more personalised care and support to people in those populations and I think we've made some really good progress and some of that progress has been particularly accelerated through COVID. So um, we know that um, a certain number of our population, smaller in size, tend to use more of our health and care services and they tend to be the ones obviously with more complex needs. So we've had a particular focus working with the community and voluntary sector, working through the primary care networks and before that the localities about how do we bring health and care together to identify that group of the population, engage with them early to try and um, make sure that they've got a network of support, particularly addressing things like social isolation, to then be able to respond very quickly with a multidisciplinary response as their needs escalate. Um, and then similarly, how we wrap around support to enable people that require to go into hospital to get out quicker than, than they have done previously. and, and um, members that have been part of health and wellbeing boards in the past will know that people being um, delayed in hospital has been a, a concern to us and also um, the rest of the country. So um, the, the newer developments are how we're expanding the workforce within the primary care networks, which is uh, my colleagues touched on. So how we can get the right practitioner or the right health and care professional to the individual first time so they get a quick response and how we bring those workforce skills together around that population group. And we've done some really good progress around the health and social care coordinators that were mentioned, health coaches, how we're bringing in other therapy roles, how social um, care workers and care managers are part of those multidisciplinary teams. And really importantly, how we're wrapping around the community and voluntary support for those individuals. So I think we've made demonstrable improvements. And that 
that group of people often may reside in a care home. So the collective work that we've done to wrap care and support around people that are in care homes and how we both do the proactive and the responsive in reach support to those care homes has been a particular area that we've accelerated through the, the COVID period, um, as well as how we work together across our quality teams around the support around quality and infection and prevention uh, control within care homes. Um, so that's been a particular theme. You will hear, if you haven't already, um, the, the, the term home first. So that this has been a national um, directive which um, came to light through COVID about a, a real, um, really strong directive about how we need to change um, in terms of engaging people to get out of hospital more, quick, uh, more quickly because it doesn't do them any good to stay in longer. So Dorset Healthcare and, and Christine as the SRO for that work program has pulled partners together to really look at how we can escalate that work program around home first and that in a way is um, superseding what we previously brought to the health and wellbeing boards around the better care fund. So the Better Care Fund and the metrics that sat behind there were very much around how you reduce people that are delayed in hospital, how you avoid people not going into hospital unless they really clinically need to. Um, and so we have brought those two things together in terms of our, our strategy of service improvement and, and also reflecting the metrics that we there then measure success on. Um, and just to mention, because it's referenced in the paper, that the we've just had this confirmed today that for um, the Better Care Fund, it's a rollover from the previous year rather than anything radically different um, and a focus, as I've mentioned, about the, the interface with our Home First programme. So I would say that we've had made really good progress, real commitment from all partners. Um, we will still continue to, to go on that journey. Um, and at the other end of the, the spectrum, a real increasing focus on about how we address together um, health inequalities and understand the wider determinants of health um, using our sort of digital insights that we've got around population health management approaches to that and more personalised support offers to um, different population groups. Um, so really good progress but very much a, a partnership um, contribution to that rather than one sector or another. I'm happy to take any questions on, on that when you're ready Chair. Thank you, Sally. Um, Tim, if you'd like to deal with the other items, then I think we'll try and take all the questions together. Yeah. Okay, so shall I introduce uh, uh, Debbie, let Debbie give an update on just the acute hospitals and what's been going on, particularly with the uh, creation of University Hospitals Dorset. Uh, Debbie? Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, I know it's been quite a long meeting, so people must be feeling a bit tired by now, and I will endeavour to be uh, brief, but also very interesting, because this is so exciting, um, and just really, really delighted by what we're doing together uh, across the wider Dorset, uh, but absolutely big impact for local residents within uh, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. So um, we have to remember we've got a great plan in Dorset, and I, whenever I'm talking about what we're doing with the hospitals, I remind everybody that actually our plan is actually all about much greater prevention, much earlier intervention in the way we've been talking about throughout this meeting. Um, and that's, that's at the heart of all of our plans and to develop really robust seven day services out in the community that are integrated and meet the needs of local people. So really a key component of making sure that we deliver the right things in terms of hospital care, we have to see the investment and the development in the community to make sure that we, we are absolutely only bringing people into hospital when we really need to do so. So in many ways, the whole plans around what's changing with health services and health and social care services, uh, the hospitals are only a tiny bit, but of course, as always, when we're talking about acute care, it's got big sums of money involved with it and um, and in order to deliver some of those services we need quite a bit of kit and equipment and buildings so the great news is as you probably know that we have been able to draw down um, an awful lot of capital national capital to take forward these plans and i think the last time i checked it was 201 million pounds literally just for the bit that's around the development of the bournemouth pool uh, bournemouth and pool sites and that's massive sums of money uh, and it's because we've got good system plans um, so what are the benefits of all that? And again, we need much more time to look at a whole range of patient benefits and improvements for local people that all these changes will mean. But the, if it, for me, it just sort of sums up in terms of the hospital care. We want people to get swift access 
to consistently high quality safe care within our hospitals. And in order to do that, we absolutely need this big building programme because at the moment we've got services being delivered from sites. Um, it, it's grown up historically, uh, but we know the models we've planned are to have the major emergency hospital and the planned care site. Um, now, the merger that we've been through, we are now University Hospitals Dorset. I have to say that um, it, that feels really encouraging. And I think for many staff, many of us have been on a long journey with all of this. But people recognise that we can do everything better together for our local people as a consequence of being a bigger organisation on a firmer footing. And it's really encouraging to see what a difference that's making already in terms of recruitment, because we're seeing more people wanting to come into uh, Dorset to work, more people applying for roles for us they're very excited by uh, the university hospital status which shows a real commitment to innovation and research and they can see the exciting plans that we've got so staff want to come and be a part of this so we all the things we've been talking about we're beginning to see now in fruition so the merger that we've recently had puts us on a really good strong platform for delivering all of these improved outcomes and patient benefits um, so, uh, but to do it, I would just reinforce what, what does all this mean for the health and wellbeing board? Well, we absolutely want and need the development of services and the focus on tackling inequalities and, in, and supporting prevention, early intervention. That is meat and drink to me because that's what we need to get things right for local people so they don't have to come to hospital. But within all that, we cannot deliver these changes or get these benefits without our building program being completed. So there are some things that are better. We can join teams up better across the sites because we've now merged and that's wonderful to see what's already being done to improve things by working more collaboratively across the three sites. Um, but actually the building programme means most of these full benefits. For example, a brand new maternity unit that is co-located with paediatric services and right next door to the critical care facility. That fantastic development we won't see in place uh, for another four to six years with the building programme, but we need, I would love the support from all health and wellbeing board members to get the uh, all of the, the planning permission sorted, to get all of the benefits understood and, and, and communicating this with local people because I want everyone to feel excited. So I think I can probably stop there, Tim. I'm happy to answer any questions. I would love to have more time again to update people on where we are and what's going on with all the buildings and the detail of the benefits. And I can tell you that the, the, that, that level of detail is very, very extreme in terms of the exact numbers and the type of benefit that we expect to see and whether it's uh, pre-buildings or post-buildings. So happy to share all that at a later date. Thank you. Okay, Tim, thanks, Debbie. is there anything that you'd like to add before we open up to board members? No, I, I suggest we just go go straight to questions. As, as Debbie said, there's a whole there's a whole workshop we could do on some of the patient benefits of uh, the thing. So I, I think we just don't open up to any questions or observations people have. Well, I think as well as uh, you know thinking about that future work program, um, I think the big so what question is one that this um, board would be very welcome to look into. You know, many of us have been on this this journey um, for quite some time, and uh, you know we've um, we've taken our population with us most of the time, but there have been concerns um, amongst po you know pockets or local areas, local um, groups groups of people that this wasn't the right thing to do um, and assurances were given that their interests were always being um, borne in mind and I think it's there's a, a clarity and accountability as well as um, you know an assurance for the board itself that would be very welcome so I'd certainly um, think that would be uh, uh, quite helpful clearly we need to make sure that the uh, we don't um, tread on the toes of health scrutiny, but I do think there's a piece of work that probably does belong with the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, so if I may go to uh, go to questions now, Karen Loftus. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was uh, just to talk about the first work, um, Community Action Network and Dorset Community Action in Dorset are looking forward to working with in how we um, have a, a discussion around what the wraparound care and what the role of the voluntary and community sector is, is now and could be in the future. And that's an exciting new development that we're going to be um, looking at and moving forward at pace in January. So um, just, just leading on from what others have said. Thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. Sam. Thanks, Chair. Uh, is it just a comment rather than a question in a way that might be helpful in joining up some of the dots across the different priorities? So when Sally was talking about the potential of the population health management work, I think I'd just like to make the board aware of just the huge possibilities of using that data set to inform how we might look at bringing forward some of those actions under the delivery plan. So one of the challenges that we've always had with a big focus on universal services in particular is that sometimes they may well not be taken up as fully by some sectors of the community as others. And that level of insight now that we get through the primary care data really enables uh, much, much closer interrogation of where services and service models are working well for communities and where there might be instances where they're working less well. So I think it's, um, it, it's a good underpinning tool to start to look at how we show through the board um, some of the ways that we might be able to bring uh, a much sort of sharper focus to some of our questions supporting that statutory duty around joint strategic needs assessment so it's a little bit it's it's a bit more of a forensic lens if you like on some of those strategic issues tying up the need to be a little bit more responsive and mindful of how um, services can be delivered differently for communities but I think it's a it's a fantastic addition to the tools that we have uh, and I hope that we'll be able to showcase that going forwards. Thank you Sam. Uh, did, Debbie, did you want to respond to that or um, are you happy to leave it there? Great. All right. Well, thank you um, very much for that. It's been um, a really useful, um, uh, both an update in itself, but I think certainly a note for future work for the board. Um, and uh, we perhaps might need to put some leave, um, set aside a reasonable amount of time for that. Um, just before I go back to uh, take, um, move on to Jan, can I take us back to the recommendations that we have before us and just make sure that there is um, uh, that we are focused on them? Right. Um, and those are that we have. Um, uh, we've considered the initial plans, um, although we've asked ourselves some further questions. Um, is everybody agreed that um, we've slightly taken it as, um, uh, as already written that the promoting healthy lives we should carry on concurrently um, with the improving mental health and eliminating food? And I'm sure that should be insecurity. So if we can make sure that's um, uh, that's clarified in the uh in the minutes everybody's happy for that i can't see um any dissent from that um the um forward plan um i think we're going to be de developing we're going to be getting on to that very soon um but i do wonder whether anybody would either like to volunteer now or um come back on um, whether anyone would like to take on a specific um, uh, part of the strategy in uh, in a sponsorship role within the board. Um, it's nothing formal, it's just that it would be very nice to share some leadership around that. Um, there are no, um, no hands showing, so I think that's possibly a piece of work that we might want to take outside of the meeting. Perhaps Democratic uh, can help us moving forward with that. So we will move on now to our last substantive item, which um, Jan, I wonder if you could um, kindly present the forward plan and also um, make reference to the had some of which will be um, going in there, but other um, items probably need addressing at the development sessions. Uh, thank you, Chair. So in terms of the forward plan, um, it, it, it is deliberately at the moment um, light because we wanted it to be shaped by by today. So um, just to highlight that the next development session in, in January is a long-standing commitment to have a development session which is focused on the development of both the local plan uh, and uh, also the housing strategy. So um, that next meeting on the 21st of January will be devoted to that. We know that um, development, but particularly good housing, is key to health and wellbeing um, 
So uh, really looking forward to that opportunity for a development session uh, as we as we as a council lead on both of those fundamental strategies. Uh, and then uh, at the next formal board meeting, we'd obviously want to come back to the local outbreak management plan. Um, uh, then the other thing that um, we wanted to do from today was just pick pick up all of the, the issues for the development plan from the delivery plan. One um, uh, ask that I don't think we drew forward was that the Health and Wellbeing Board would provide some governance over the work that's done on elimit elim eliminating food insecurity. So if the board's happy to provide that, that governance um, through and take regular reports, that would be really good. Um, and also, I think in terms of development sessions, the areas where we particularly highlighted development sessions were, as Tim and Debbie was highlighting, that really looking at the significant changes in health and how they will over time make uh, long term um, input into, into well-being does feel that, that that would be a really good development session, one or two to have. And the other area probably we'd want to come back in development session. I think Kate invited, did say that all mem all board members would be invited to participate in the work in the two key areas where we're we're looking at um, local community empowerment. And it might be good to think about a development session at some point in the year to really look at that work and see how that's going. We will also be taking formal, um, bringing formal board papers back on the Better uh, Care Fund, as we're required to do. But actually, as Sally's um, presentation highlighted, um, and there was reference that Karen made to the Home First programme, really, when we come back with the Better Care Fund, we went to do a much wider um, look at the Home First programme as well, and the work that's been done uh, through the pandemic in relation to uh, work with our care homes, particularly, where we've seen real development and growth. That's a fantastic um, summing up, Jan. Thank you very much for that. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Are we happy to take that forward with, with support, as always, from Democratic Services to, to move this along? Nope, that's looking like a plan. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one potential issue. Councillor Dove, did you want to add something now? I'm sorry, I've not... We've been trying to correspond through the uh, through the message bar. Was there something you wanted to raise now, or shall we deal with it through the minutes? Um, I, I really don't mind, Chair. Um, I did raise my hand. It's obviously uh, I appreciate. I'm so sorry. Um, no, no, it's quite okay. It's a very difficult way of trying to run meetings and and monitor everything's going on. It was literally just that one reference of um, making it gender specific to non gender specific. If the board are happy to make that um, substitution, I would be most grateful. Um, happy to do it via the minutes or, or however you see fit. Um, thank you. We can take that away and just um, give you the assurance that it will be addressed. So um, I th think we have, yes, Louise, sorry, we have run a minute over. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but can I thank you all for your patience and your forbearance in dealing with another virtual meeting, um, but most particularly for your attendance um, and uh, commitment to the agenda. Um, we will get together again in January, and um, I think I'm allowed to say this now. Have a very happy Christmas um, and see you next year. Thank you. Thanks,